Hey boys and girls, this is Mike again, your host of Craft Beer Storm, also owner and founder and brewer at Barra Brewing Company in glorious Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Today we have uh, the Mass Brew Brothers uh, on our podcast. Uh, they're, they're two guys who have, are really promoting uh, the uh uh, beer in Massachusetts and doing a lot of good work. I mean, they're all over the state, you know, promoting new breweries and, and creating communities and connecting people. And they've done a lot of good stuff. They came up to our brewery uh, about a year or two ago. Uh, but yeah, we had a good conversation with them. So uh, let's get to it. Hey, we're here with uh, Bob Kelly and Rob Van. They are the Mass Brew Brothers. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Yeah, we're good, Michael. How are you? I'm okay. Thanks for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. You know, you guys are doing some, some good things in Massachusetts. I see a lot of your uh, blogs and uh, Facebook posts. And, uh, you know, I wanted to get you on and uh, get get your perspective on craft beer in Massachusetts and, you know, what you see in terms of trends. And But let's let's start first uh, with your story. How did you get started? You know, where are you now? What, what are you planning to do? What's your mission with Mass Brew Brothers? Bob, you want to start with a little background real quick? Yeah. Uh, well, Rob and I have known each other for over 25 years. We were rival high school basketball coaches, and what would happen is eventually we became friends, and we would go up to coaching. Like, I got some coaches to get together on, like, Friday nights, you know, just kind of get together and talk about our games. And we used to go to places like Rock Bottom and Brew Moon and places like that. And then we grew up in the 80s where there wasn't a lot of options for beer and now we saw this kind of craft beer thing going on. Well, well this is different. So it kind of piqued our interest. Um, then I would probably say, you fast forward, Rob was kind of a budding filmmaker, and he did a documentary on beer. So he asked me to go to some festivals and do some other things with him, and it really kind of broadened our horizons in terms of what beer could really be. Um, and then kind of the genesis out of that, going to the festivals, we, we saw these guys with these, uh, like, matching drinking shirts and, like, Turned to Rob, like, well, why don't we have drinking shirts? So that's where the <laughs> Mass Brew Bros and, and name kind of came up. And and the and rest is the history, shirts. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we, now, do you guys brew any beer? Have you brewed any beer, or are you just kind of, you just enjoy beer? Uh, we have brewed in the past, but uh, we came to the conclusion pretty early on that we were much better at drinking other people's <laughs> beer than brewing our own. <laughs> you know what? People come in and say, you know what? I, I really can't do the brewing thing, but I will consume. And, uh, you know, I, you have to, you have to look at that and say, you know what, that, that might be a better idea. It's a very, it's a very, uh, labor intensive business. There's a lot of ups and downs roller coasters but uh in the end it's great when somebody can try your beer and say yeah no that was really good so you make something that that people like you know i'm, I'm a cpa i don't know if you know that i do a lot of audit work so whenever i go in and people see me they're like oh when when you're leaving i'm like i just got here what are you talking about and then when i'm uh when i'm a brewer i say hey i'm a brewer as well and oh my god oh like what are you making and can i have some samples and you know can we get some beer and it's just 180 but i'd rather do i'd rather do the brewing part we're working on that we're working on that but well if everyone was a brewer there wouldn't be anyone to drink the beer so we decided to help you guys out this is true thank you very much thank you (laughs) Uh, but, um, one side one side note to that though is as an aside um we have been really interested recently in not brewing ourselves so much but getting involved with breweries to sort of figure out an interesting unique sort of beer which uh you could call it a collaboration i suppose we basically just show up and throw a few things into the mash and um, you know, it's a funny, novel, interesting beer, and then we try to have an event around it. We did one uh, with Dorchester Brewing Company uh, a few months ago for National Pretzel Day, where we uh, brewed a, a special sort of pretzel-themed beer with um, a pretty good pretzel-making beer company called Wicked Twisted Pretzels, who's out of Massachusetts, but they've got their pretzels in all sorts of tap rooms around the around the area so um, wicked twisted uh, pretzels that's an awesome new england name yeah <laughs> yeah that's absolutely. an awesome new england name yeah, so we're so. interested in that side of the brewing side of it is you know coming up with funny little interesting ideas and then seeing oh, if we yeah. can 
convince somebody to. I <laughs> love collaborations. Collaborations are awesome. You know, like we put ingredients in our beer as well, like local honey or local, uh, you know, maple syrup. We also infuse. Uh, there's a barbecue place up a street, so we infuse their barbecue, uh, their buffalo wow. wing sauce into our beer, and we did another one with uh, bacon chipotle barbecue sauce, infused it in the stout, and it came out really good. Yeah, we, like we to, sell local pretzels. Why not local pretzels? So, uh, yeah, they have the <laughs> actually quite city. a tasty beer. It was a dunkel with uh, forty pounds of soft pretzels in it, so oh. it actually came out quite good. It was wow. very tasty. Wow, wow, yeah. Oktoberfest is coming up. We have to figure it out. Yeah. you know, try to make a good. <laughs> yeah. good uh, I'd love to go to Oktoberfest. I went there once. Have you been to uh, Munich when they had Oktoberfest? Or I have not. No, I have been. I have been to Munich, but uh, not during Oktoberfest, unfortunately. But even then, the beer is awesome there in Munich. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, Oktoberfest is one of our favorite times of the season. We're really, really excited for a lot of the local celebrations coming up here. Um, we actually do a series of blind tastings. We've done a number of those as part to you know connect to the community of Mass beer, and that's the next one we're really working on to do an Oktoberfest and uh, Mars and type of blind tasting. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we have to figure out. Usually we do a half of ice, and last year we did a, a Weizenbach, which was really nice. It came out very nice, so I have to figure it out. Nice. Well, it's, you know, it's like I should be moving here because it's the end of August here, and <laughs> I really got to make something because we're coming up to that. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, we're, we're kicking the ideas around, but, you know, it takes a while to, you know, ferment. And as you know, you know, it's not like you add powder to powder, powder to water and then there's poof, there's beer. It takes a pro – it's a process. Process. So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, um, your whole, your whole, um, you know, reason for doing the Mass Brew Brothers, um, I guess you, you visited breweries all over the state, right? I mean, how, how have your experiences been anything to share? Yeah. Actually, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rob. Our experience has been awesome. And as Bob, I think, was going to say, that's really what did sort of drive the actual Mass Brew Bros as an entity. We had the shirts and the nicknames and we were having a good time, but we came to the conclusion that it was really hard. This is going back about three years ago or so now. It was really hard to find a central location to know where are all the different breweries because things were starting to move pretty quickly. There were lots of new breweries and as we were out on the road, we would come across all sorts of new places and hear things from people in other tap rooms. And then we said, well, why don't we start a Twitter account and see if people are interested in this? And sure enough, they were. And then we said, let's do a website where we would list all the breweries, have a map so people could know who's there and, and what they've got going on. And that took off. And so that was really the driver behind it. That and the fact that having the shirts is kind of a funny thing because we would come up to a brewery or go to a festival and people would look at us with the sort of work shirts and the, and the name tags. And they'd be like, Hmm, mass brew bros. They must be somebody. And you know, we'd get a VIP <laughs> treatment or we'd get brought in through the yeah. back door of a festival. <laughs> That's awesome. It was at least an inn. It was like, this, it was you like have a nice, yeah, you have a nice logo. It's conference. very appealing. Like, Oh um, my gosh, th these guys must be uh yeah. Royalty or something. <laughs> right. Well, you came yeah. up to our brewery. I remember with, uh, we were talking beforehand with aloe and the, uh, Pints of Portsmouth, right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we just recently saw him. He's on San Diego now taking some beer courses, and we just saw him over the weekend at Slumbrew in Somerville. Oh, did you? He came um, back for a visit. Yeah, he, he started the uh, Pints of Portsmouth. They took uh, individuals from uh, Boston area, and yeah. they brought him up to Portsmouth to a, a bunch of breweries up there, and we were one of the stops, and that's how you guys, uh, that's how I was introduced to you guys, but that was a while ago. Was that a year yeah. or two ago? Or I don't know. I, uh, it was two I think and a half it's two. Years ago, probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it was like February. Of, yeah, <laughs> a couple of Februarys ago. Yeah. Wow. But so yeah, that was, was great. Time yeah, flies. Was fun up time flies. But I wanted to reach out to you guys again because I remember you guys came up, and uh, I always see you all over the internet. And um, what do you find is 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 good for you guys? Do you find Twitter or Instagram or Facebook? What what is the most uh, responses you get from I, I think i think it's uh it's different things for different people which is why we're on a lot of different platforms we uh, instagram facebook we find the reach is different people um i said we probably use instagram as more of a creative side we take a lot more you know promote pictures and stuff of beer um it's more um information based on on facebook slash you know twitter trying to get the information like some 
our blogs, the press releases, and things. Out, um, craftier events that we might be promoting probably use that. Because um, I don't, you know, I don't think this. People seem to choose different level, different platforms for different reasons. You know, maybe skew a certain age wise or whatever. So, um, but we've, you know, we've been fairly moving forward. You know, on, on all platforms in terms of our followers. So that's been a positive thing. So, and the website as well. A lot of people actually just frequent the website. Uh, if they're not really into social media so much. Um, so I'd say between the four of them, yeah, I mean, it's hard to, to say. I'd, I'd break it down that, like Bob said, depending on the person, they might go to any one of those four platforms, including the website. So it's a lot of work to keep up with all four. But it is. I think it, um, I think it seems worthwhile because we have a pretty loyal following on each sort of, area so. i guess you know you're smart to do every one you know because you never know who's going to be on what and what their preferred uh you know uh social media site is and it's good but it's a lot of work like you said what do you guys split up the the, the efforts or does one person do all the social media or how's that yeah work? we have a we have a sort of a split up um i do a little more of the website side of things and bob does more of the social media side of things but we also do sort of crossover uh, with a number of things as well. Um, I do a little more of the writing sort of side of things. And he does most Bob, of the writing, let's be honest. <laughs> we try, Bob, honestly, we're trying to play to our strengths. I mean, Bob's yeah. really a very good writer. And so, you know, I can contribute where I can, but he's really better at that. You know, I, I consider myself a pretty good shutterbug in terms of taking pictures, pictures and visual things. So mm -hmm. it lends more to the social media. Um, we both try and track down, you know, like information and stuff like that. But, you know, we, we try and play to our things, and I think that's been successful for us in that way. So, I like your videos on your website. They're really just very simple. You just turn the camera on and you just kind of, you know, just yeah, envision from, uh, like you're in the tap room. Like you'd have like flights sure. and just like, you know, or people it, filling growlers and stuff like that. But they're kind of yeah, get a sense of, yeah. Film days. He just kind of like, you know, he wanted to do like, he, he, he like, I want to, like a mini glimpse. Let's just shoot a quick minute in the tap room so you gotta get a sense of what's going on. Yeah. That's from his kind of film stuff then. No, so. I think yeah, that's great. Yeah, unfiltered. We're probably, you know? we're probably due for that. We haven't done one in a little while, so uh probably yeah. something we should start to revisit. But there's always just so much going on in the crappier scene now that it's it's hard to fucking time to do everything. How many brewers yeah. are there in Massachusetts right now? Do you know the number? I I do, yeah. That's uh, another area that we really have been working hard at is um, we kind of pride ourselves on knowing exactly how many breweries there are, where they are, what type of brewery they are, et cetera, et cetera. And we work pretty well with uh, the Mass Brewers Guild, providing them with a lot of that data. Um, the number for Massachusetts right now is actually up to 165 wow. if you include contract brands and uh, a handful of breweries that are production only and don't have a tap room the vast majority of breweries seem to have a tap room now but yeah it's 165 and that's funny you should ask i just was looking this up recently for another big blog we have coming out probably this week uh there we're closing in on 500 craft breweries in new england it's it's wow. going to get there probably within another month or two there will be 500 craft breweries because there's there's a lot of pending breweries in addition to the all the ones that are open and the new ones. So it's it's a really dynamic, fast moving market. Yeah, uh, and well, in New Hampshire, there's uh, 80 plus breweries, but uh, the population of Massachusetts is is just I'm not sure how many times it is. I think there's only nine million people in New Hampshire, like for the state, but I'm not sure what the population in Mass is. But uh, you're you're probably it's probably good ratio it's at least double i would think um in massachusetts i'm not sure the yeah well population. i mean obviously the city of boston is a very large city you know it's probably yeah. about six hundred thousand in that city alone so that's obviously the population center would be from new england but so. yeah so, a lot of people to serve beer to <laughs> there is and a lot of thirsty people and it's good um and a lot of good beers coming out of massachusetts um you know uh, just good stuff everybody loves it um, what do you see in terms of trends in the craft beer industry? I mean, not, not necessarily, I, I, I know you focus on Massachusetts, but what do you see kind of, um, 
you know, in, in the in the U.S. and maybe worldwide. Like we're not limiting ourselves just to one state or one city, or we're just sure. kind of looking at the the trends. You know, uh, you know, U.S. and worldwide. What do you see happening? So I'll choose one or two, and then Bob, maybe you can jump in with another thought if you have one. Um, at least in the U.S., obviously the tap room is a pretty amazing trend. Um, you go back just five years ago and even legally speaking, a lot of nobody or most breweries weren't even allowed to really have a tap room. Now that those laws have been changed, uh, it's really taken off. Like I was saying of the 165 brands that we have in Massachusetts, I think that it's almost 120 of them have their own tap room. And that seems pretty much the same to me, at least when I've been around, uh, not just New England, but when I've traveled to other parts of the country, that seems to be a huge trend and a pretty lucrative one for breweries. I mean, obviously yeah. selling straight to the customer is, is pretty helpful. Yes, that that's the best margin. And uh, that's that's what people, uh, you know, they open their smaller breweries and that's what keeps them alive. So um, it's really returned to what happened, you know, you know, several hundred years ago when it was just married to your local tavern, they made it there. It wasn't that kind of the, the big beer and distribution centers that, you know, started to dominate in the last century. So it's really kind of turned out having a really hyper-local, you brew right there, the local community comes down and just enjoys the beer there. So It is hyper-local, and it's, uh, you see a lot of these uh, larger breweries uh, that are uh, distributing all over the United States. They're pulling back, and some of them have gone out of business, actually, you know, yeah. within the last couple of months. Which is sad to see, but um, it it just kind of reinforces the trend of local and and buying local. And um, you know, you you have a brewery in your backyard, just go and you know, go and try it out. Yeah. You know, go into the tap. Yeah, Rob and I were talking about that just earlier in terms of you know, like and like these breweries like New Belgium or, or Bell's uh, from Michigan are starting to you know come to Massachusetts and the area and push their products and. You know, they're good breweries and enjoy their beer, but you know, you just think, you know, a lot of people are choosing their local options. You just wonder how they would do, you yeah. know, by coming out here or something again, like, like Green Flash, you know, recently pulled everything back and, you know, uh, uh and because they wouldn't you know, get expanded and just the market wasn't there, um, to, to do that, you know. Yeah. And, um, yeah, uh, founders, I think, pulled out of New Hampshire, six point. Like all these bigger breweries are are distributing um, far and wide, they're they're pulling back, um, and I think, um, yeah, New Belgium too. I think they're pulling out too. They they expanded into the northeast, but they're pulling back because they're seeing yeah, a lot of the uh, a lot of the local trends. Because the people are drinking at the breweries, it's you know you go and again if you're an average craft beer drinker, especially you know if you go into a bar, or restaurant, or a local bottle shop, you're probably not even sure what you're looking at and you know, some of those brands outside could just be kind of white noise and people are going to choose you. And that's, you know, so, you, so I would think it'd be very difficult um, to, to market here, if, you know, if you don't really have a good foot standing and someone like, hey, this guy's a local, I might try these guys. So. Yeah, you also need a sales force too. You know, they, they want yes. to expand and they want Chicken to be all, coffee, you got to have yeah. a sales guy pouring beer at the local craft beer store or store. Yep. And it, and that costs money too. So they, I guess they're rapidly finding out that like, yeah, this is not a good idea. We better pull back. Yeah, the return rate and, on some of that, yeah. And, I yeah, guess, and the, other, yeah. the other interesting thing about the sort of marketing standpoint is that it's getting easier for smaller local breweries to do a reasonably good job of of marketing on social media, which is free in a sense. I mean, you've got to have somebody who's taking the time to do that, and you might even have to pay somebody, but it's probably cheaper than the whole Salesforce thing. And if you can draw people to your tap room and sell it straight out of the tap room and get that profit rather than having to distribute and have the sales for us i mean that's that's pretty helpful yeah i mean it's it's a great thing the social media you know facebook ads and 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 you know you can pay like a fraction of the cost um a lot of the bigger uh, mediums like the newspaper i mean who reads the newspaper right. anymore i don't know i'm not just i mean you know i don't read a news well, like i don't know maybe you might buy the new york times on a sunday or something like that but yeah and i want to say i don't know anyone does a local tv ad yeah, I mean, messing with TV after local, you couldn't couldn't pull that off. So 
No, I, I mean, that- yeah, local, like radio ads, it's, that stuff's expensive, you know, especially for yeah. smaller breweries. Like, you know, people would come in and say, oh, yeah, it's only like a thousand a week. I'm like, a thousand a week? Are you <laughs> kidding me or what? You know? So uh, I guess so maybe if thing- you stick with it for, I don't know, a year, it might pay off, but that's a lot of money. It's fifty two thousand dollars, you know. I don't know. One last thought on that is that I did uh see a statistic recently that stated something to the extent of seventy percent of millennials basically get their beer knowledge and choices from social media. Right. They get all the news from social so, media these days. They get everything so, from social media. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, I believe it. You know, it's just, you know, when you need something, you have it in your pocket. You have, you know, you don't have yeah. to go anywhere. You used, you used to have to go to a library or something a long time ago and look up information. Now you can just Google it and find whatever you need, you know, in <laughs> yeah. seconds, pretty much, you know, and, and local beer. Let's say a lot of people wander into our tap room. They just. They go in, you know, local breweries in Portsmouth, and then we pop up, and then they show up. And it's like, well, how'd you find us? Well, yeah, I just Googled you, and, and you showed up. I'm like, that's awesome. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Here's some beer. Here's a flight. Try all the beer, you know. So that that's a great thing that, that brings people in. And we're trying to, um, you know, do some ads on, on Facebook as well to see if we can uh, bring more people in. And uh, like you said, the tap room is uh, is a great uh, avenue. I think, you can really, I think you can really create a buzz, too, from social media. Because I think, especially young people, it's not only about the beer. I think it's really become like a lifestyle and, and something they want to do and be a part of. So if you can create that buzz through pictures and, and memes or, you know, all these other things on, on social media and get them excited. Hey, that looks interesting. I, I'm it's excited, a, you know, it's about cool, that. I want to yeah, go check these guys out, you know. It's a cool thing. It's a cool dynamic. They're very, you know, everybody's into their phones. And, like, if you look at a room, like, everybody's looking down at their, their stupid phone. <laughs> but then they're looking at their phone to go to a brewery. And then they can go there and socialize with people and, and sit and have a beer and talk. So it's a it's a nice balance, you know, if you think about it. Um, yeah. Another trend, um, if we have time to chat about that a yeah. little more, Bob, maybe you could start on this one, is I guess the trend obviously would be towards IPAs for the last several years. Oh, yeah, that was the the next question, like what, what kind of beer do you see uh, <laughs> going? But everybody's IPA. But I think, and I, I said this on another podcast, um, is that I think more and more people, um, and that's why I started this whole podcast, because I go into these stores and I see 90% of the you know, beer aisle or beer section, like this, this big beer and buy a suitcase for $10 for 24, you know, cans. And I'm like, buy, buy some water, buy like a tray of water. It's better for you. And, uh, <laughs> or, or buy like, you know, buy like four pack, of you know, buy a four pack of 16 ounce, you know, from your local brewery, you'll be much more satisfied, you know? Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you know, um, the IPAs are, are, are here, they're here, pretty much here to stay because I see a lot of these people coming off their lagers, the, the mass produced and then trying an IPA and they're like, Oh man, this is, this is really good. I didn't realize beer was like this, you know, but and then they yeah. try it and then they get hooked. I mean, I love IPAs too, but I also try to influence people to drink, uh, you know, there's like 200 different styles. If you look at the Brewers Association, uh, there, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, strong ales and, and stouts and all kinds of stuff, you know, German beers and, uh, but, but that's, that's kind of what, you know, the IPA, uh, it's going to be here for a while, I think. I mean, when probably when Rob and I really would describe the both of us, would describe ourselves as more malt forward drinkers. We, you know, give me a Scotch ale, give, you know, give us an Oktoberfest. We, we enjoy malty beers, I would say mostly, but, but having done this thing, just really, you know, going to so many different breweries, you know, we've learned to try everything. And, um, I, and I think IPAs are definitely, um, probably you know a little more palatable to maybe the masses because they're looking some more a little more flavor, especially the, especially like you know New England IPAs where the mouth feel is really soft and there's juicy flavors. Even things like sours now, and just I think it draws other people into and instead of just you know something that's so overly bitter or you know maybe you know not have as much taste as you know like a pilsner. And again, we really enjoy those. Maybe it's not flavorful for other people. Um, so I think those type of beers have really brought a, a wider spectrum of people into it. Some people who might be, and where are you going to get market share? I mean, you, you got, I mean, it's not all, all big beer you're getting it from. You're getting it from 
some wine drinkers, you know, some, you know, some cider people, some other people were, hey, all right, if you make a, a Berliner Weiss, maybe I would try that. Um, I just think it's opened up, uh, the craft beer has really opened up a lot of people's eyes to what beer can be, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, but but the big trend is, uh, and, and people have been brainwashed about beer should be a light color, uh, which, you know, that, that's not the truth, but. Um, but I understand what you're saying. It, it's a little, it's kind of a step. They have the lagers and then they want to take another step and the IPAs are there and they try the juicy IPAs, the New England style. And they're like, oh man, this is okay. good. And then what, what so else do you have on tap? Russian yeah. Imperial at 13%. <laughs> Russian Imperial. But I love Russian Imperial. They're awesome. Yeah. But, uh, but it's like one in, you're done. That's another thing. A lot of people like yeah. to, you know, have a couple of beers and, and I agree with that. But there's also a lot of sessionable beers, you know, lower ABV beers that, that these breweries are coming out with today. And, and, you know, you have to be kind of an artist to make those, to make a really, you know, flavorful. I have to say, beer. that's what I've really been into lately. In particular, uh, I drank a lot of this summer. Is, uh, Castle Island makes a session beer called Camelton. And, you know, it's like 4 point something percent. And it's just flavorful and easy drinking. You know, we've been drinking a lot of IPAs, but... You know, and everyone's kept trying to, you know, more bitter, double IPAs, these high ABVs. And, it, you know, I, I felt like I just couldn't only drink so many of those. It's just nice to throw throw back a nice, easy drinking beer. Yeah. Like a little more flavor, like a session beer as opposed to maybe right. a lager or something like that. Right. So I've just been really into some good session. Notch makes some really great uh, session beers. So flavorful and yes. fantastic. So. Yes, they make, they do make good beer. Um you know, yeah, I understand about the sessionable and, and, you know, people, you can, you know, have so much, uh, you know, like your palate gets wrecked, you know, like you, you, <laughs> yeah. you have like yeah, all these crazy IP, like crazy hopped IPAs, you just want a nice easy beer and just, you know, hang out. And uh, I, I think a, a lot of breweries are trending, you know, that way, or at least making, you know, passion. We just made a citra of it because I had all this stuff on tap, like it was dark. We had like two double IPAs on and they're like, what's the lightest beer? I'm like, uh. I don't know, like a stout. Your Irish stout. <laughs> <laughs> and it's dark, you know, it's like mud, but mm -hmm. it's not really it's heavy, but it's, it's a sessionable, you know, it's a, it's a sessionable stout, but people are like, uh, so we made a citra of it. So we made a, a nice wheat beer for the summer and, uh, we just okay. uh, dry hopped it with some citra hops and it's a really nice, it came out really nice and people appreciate it. You know, it's a lighter beer and, um, yeah. with the lower ABV, like a four and a half percent. So uh, mi mission accomplished for that. You know, yeah, so. that's great. But um, yeah, I mean, um, wh what do you see? I mean, you you talked to like a lot of brewers uh, in your journeys. Uh, what do you see as challenges for them? You know, today, what wh what do you see them complaining about or saying? I wish I had more of this, or you know, I wish the trends would go this way. Or wh what do you see? Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head with your last comment about what I think brewers if they had their own way would love to do is to brew more variety um, and to maybe brew more of the classics. But I think that is a challenge because specifically it's beer ratings, as I see as one of the reasons driving IPAs. I mean, I, I think IPAs are tasty, especially um, the less bitter version that seems to be out there now. But they're getting the highest ratings. If you look at any beer category and look at its highest rated beers and then look at it compared to IPAs, IPAs are all, any good IPA is rated like well above four. Right. And you might look for the best Kolsch, but it's rated maybe right at four, which is sort of crazy if you think about it, because in theory, the best Kolsch out there should have just as high a rating as the best IPA. But there's a... There's a thing going on with, again, I think it's in particular the people that are on social media and on beer ratings. They they see that, and it just makes them want that beer even more, even if it's not yeah. necessarily the beer that they might like the best. So I, I think a lot of brewers would prefer to brew other things, but especially the smaller brewers who maybe only have four or five or six beers that they can crank out yeah. uh, have to have... An IPA, yeah. a double IPA, and then maybe yeah, something, yeah. something that's, else. Um, that, that's what I found. Right. I mean, I, I went when I went around, uh, you know, trying to get the beer into stores, bars, restaurants. I'm like, oh, what, you know, what, what do you see uh, people buying? They're like double IPAs. If you make a double IPA, I'll put, I'll give you a tap line. 
So we made two double IPAs. We made one with, you know, one with Galaxy Hops, which are really nice hops, and then another one with the West Coast Hop Blend. And those have been successful. And now we're canning those, you know, and people love them. You know, they keep asking us for more, and uh, but they're double. They're very expensive beer as well, but they're very, yeah. you know, they're very good. I mean, they have good good hops in them. But I understand what you're saying about the challenges and. Um, yeah, and it is a business. I mean, but so that's you, what it is. I yeah, mean, you, you want to be able to brew. I mean, you want to brew what you'd like to brew, um, but you do have to, you know, find beers that are going to be consumed by your customers. And so, and you may be right. all into, like you say, culture or whatever. But if they want an IPA, if, if you don't have it, then they're going to go elsewhere. So, right. Um, I think yeah. it is a tough balance between you know your your being a craft brewer and wanting you know wanting to brew certain things or stretch yourself in certain areas. But but in in the end, you do have to make you know beers that people are going to come in and, and drink. So. Yes, yes, that it is a business. You're right. You're correct. You know, and you can't just you know throw a bunch of hops and beer and make some some really sour beer that you know, like I don't know, maybe one percent of the population will like, and put it on tap and expect people to come in if you don't have that other IPA or that double IPA on tap because that's what people are looking for and it's a business. Yeah, there so is so another trend I think people are doing uh, and breweries are doing is that they do have uh, like a rotating series. So maybe you have you more. Your flagship, your IPA, sort of, but they have a number of breweries have gone to a rotating series, i.e., like Night Shift Morph. You know, so they play with this and they kind of play with different versions of of IPAs, or um, maybe maybe this is a certain Berliner Weiss series. Or so they can there are some pilot breweries and they do some rotating things um, out there, like experimenting but, uh, and getting it out there. Yeah, that, that's yeah. that's good. It just educates people on the different types of beer, and they might try they might try get a sample of it, and they're like, oh my god, this beer is awesome. You know, and that might be their new favorite beer. But, um, yeah, I mean, um, it, it's a good thing. It's it's great. There's a bunch of breweries in Massachusetts that are doing a great job. Um, so one other quick thought on the, the business side of things, another challenge that um, we see that will be very interesting to follow in the next few years is what we were talking about earlier, the, the rapid growth of new breweries. And for consumers it's a great thing i mean we like it but for breweries obviously it's going to start to get more competitive and that will be very interesting to see how that all unfolds if you take a look at the most recent brewers association um data on the growth of all the breweries across the country if you look at the bigger breweries anywhere but in new england as well uh, a lot of those bigger breweries lost market share this past year, and I think they didn't lose it because craft beer sales decreased. They actually increased. I think it was five percent, but I think they lost market share because there's, like we talked about, twice as many breweries open now as there were three or four years ago. Absolutely, it is getting more competitive. You know, I see it in Portsmouth as well. There's a bunch of breweries that just opened up in the past uh, two years, and you can see it. You know, I mean, it's just being spread. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of people that come into town, and um, you know, there was a handful of breweries before, but now there's a, there's a load, and the bigger guys are getting hammered. You know, um, and they have to figure out what to do. Either, you know, uh, change or, or you know, uh, to survive, they have to figure out another plan. So. Yeah, I think it's hardest for the biggest breweries. Um, for the medium-sized breweries, I think they just need to make some good business decisions. And for new breweries, uh, you know, if you make a good beer, have a decent location, and you have some business sense, you can probably be all right. But it'll be interesting. I mean, we are also interested to see, will there be another shakeout like there was around you know around the late 90s early 2000s because there was a real rapid growth then too it wasn't a bust or anything or a bubble really but there was a shakeout and it'll be interesting to see if there's either a shakeout coming again or if like we said maybe just some of these bigger breweries just are gonna not be able to grow anymore possibly even lose some market share to all these other uh, much smaller breweries that are yeah. popping up all over the place. I think if I was going to open a brewery today, I'd I'd be small and just more fluid. You know, you have to be fluid sure. in this market and pivot. These larger oh, breweries, yeah. if they're making a certain style or they have a you know brand out there, and then it just falls out of favor, they're screwed. You know, 
I mean, they have. Oh, they, yeah. they just have the, all this marketing invested in it, and salespeople and displays, and you can't pivot. You know, you just <laughs> you get you right. get hurt. Um, yeah, you know? it's a very dynamic market. And uh, another interesting <laughs> thought off of that is, I mean, just look at the sixteen ounce four pack of cans two years ago oh. that barely barely existed anywhere, and now all of a sudden it's everywhere. And it's not even just the people that specialize in New England IPAs anymore. It's everybody now. And yeah. again, like you were saying, if you had put, you know, Money into a bottling line. tens of thousand dollars into oh, yeah. a bottling line or something, now all of a sudden you're like, oh, man, what are we going to do now? Right. Now we need to get a canning line. And yeah. And so, yeah, that that yeah, a, a couple of breweries, uh, you know, went under because they just bought these massive bottling lines. And then, you know, like nobody wants bottles anymore. And. You know, for smaller brewers like me, I had to figure it out. I'm like, I used to do 22 ounce bombers, and they were awesome, and everybody was buying them. And I'm like, oh, I can make money on this. This is awesome. But now it's cans. You know, we're a small yeah. brewery, but I have to do. I do the four pack, so I have the the snap cap lids, and I have the cans yeah. and the labels, and all that stuff's expensive. Uh, sure. But but this is what the package that people want. So you have to give people what they want. It's just the same thing with the IPA. You got to give them an IPA if they want it. You got to give them an IPA, so that's the way you package yeah. your product right now. And I mean the can, the can label art as well. The can design and label art is that sort of a trending thing as well. A lot of these people are trying to stick out, if you will, especially on the shelves of package stores by having a really interesting design that's colorful or has something really interesting or funny or yeah. some expensive artwork. And there are some really well noted artists out there who are making a pretty solid living right now off of just designing beer cans yeah yeah it's a it's a big um it's a big trend the whole uh graphics and uh it's interesting you know and, and um, you also try to find something that's identifiable again again you go back to night shift i mean who doesn't know their hop owl i mean it's, right i mean i wouldn't say they have you know great i mean the great in terms of you know artistic label designs it's pretty straightforward but you see that hop out you know it's you know it's night shift they did a great job yeah with that, that logo so. yeah it's just notified yeah, so i, I you know, know it you know instantly yep mm -hmm. you find a sharp logo or something resonates with people and it becomes more recognizable that's that's really what you want so. and you build you build a brand so it's it's a business yep. you know it's a business um so uh, so in, in trying to wrap up, uh, what, what would you say, you know, final thoughts on how to convert people from uh, drinking this mass-produced beer uh, to trying uh, like a local craft brew? What, what do you uh, Bob can probably speak pretty well on this, but I have just one quick little anecdote that um, I have a number of older people, in-laws, uncles, family members, and they're always – intrigued and fascinated by oh yeah you do that beer thing right and <laughs> they just don't quite get it because they just that beer you know, thing you play around with right your games right they just they, <laughs> they grew up in an era where beer was not uh, what it is nowadays so i always one of the things i try to tell them to explain it i say is that you know with your generation beer was something you drank maybe but with the current generation, beer is something that you do. It's, as Bob was saying earlier, it's become more of a lifestyle thing. And it's just different than it used to be. So that's something I always sort of try to, to throw out there so that they can sort of get it. Kind of like coffee, if you look at what coffee was 30 years ago. Same thing. You right. drink Maximal House out of a Mr. Coffee machine nowadays. Every oh. every town has its own coffee shop or two or three, and just like little breweries. But that's awesome, you know. You're you're coffee. really oh, yeah. uh, promoting really good quality food, which is which is great. And also, we're we're uh, uh, one of the things we didn't talk about in terms of local, like using local products. We have local beer, but what what do you uh, what do you see out there in terms of brewers using local products in their beer or pairing with local? Com you know, we had Jaju uh, Pierogi. Up. Oh yeah. They're, they're awesome you know every time you see their their posts they're like jumping up and down they're happy and it's a great it's a great thing you know they're, they're, well, they're I, awesome I really feel like it's been a very much of a synergy between a lot of locals again you know if you had a tap room but you didn't have any food you'd have the local food truck show up so you worked at that angle or again in terms of uh, like Valley Malt and Four Star uh, Hop Farms like 
you know, you, you go source those ions. If you can make a pumpkin beer or you can make a, you know, um, strawberry beer or whatever, you get, you find a local farm and it's very much, uh, you know, works together with all these different things. You get a local musician to come in and I think people really kind of appreciate, you know, working with all, all the local people and bringing them in and being part of that. I really see craft beer as a community. Um, it doesn't it feel, is. it feels more personal than, than big beer does. So people are very happy to support that community and be a part of that. And I know for Rob and I, like we, we very much enjoy traveling all over the state and visiting breweries and seeing people and meeting new people. Um, it's just a really, just a really cool way to, to, to be and to exist in that, you know, that framework. So, and even the brewers um, that's themselves. That's really our central yeah. mission is to, our, that's been really our central mission is to, that we know you know about the big beer. We know you know about these things, but, if you know about this little guy over here, give him a try. I mean, you may, might be surprised. We really work very hard trying to let people know about every little spot and give them, you never know, you might find that next beer or the next um, cool place to hang out with or your new friend. And that's what we've really been doing yeah. for all you know, It's just years, always so. a positive vibe. You know, you go into these breweries, Absolutely. tap rooms, and just everybody's happy and you're celebrating beer and you're celebrating being together. And it's just a great thing. And, and you use the local aspect and local ingredients, local musicians, like you said, it's just, you know, you have a community, which is fantastic uh, these days to see that, you know, and even the brewers themselves, uh, the whole community of brewers help each other, you know, like, hey, I need some sure. grain uh, or I need some yeast. I, I ran out of it. Can you help me out? Or cans, you know, like I ran out of cans, uh, call Stoneface like at nine o'clock at night. I'm like, dude, <laughs> all our cans are like leaking. You know, they had a, a stamp on the bottom. Like they stamped the bottom of it and there was like a burr on the stamp and it, it made a pinhole on the bottom of every can. So we're filling oh, these man. cans and they're leaking. So we're taking videos of it. I'm like, what the heck is going on? And we had to do, you know, so I, I called them up frantically and they gave me a couple of cases and we, so they saved the day. But it's a great thing, um, you know, to see brewers uh, help each other out too. It's a great yeah, business. Yeah, brewers have been very good to us. I can't say how much. I mean, they just uh open their arms to us. I think, you know, people who talk craft brewers, they really got into the reason for to really make craft beer and to, to celebrate that lifestyle. And I think that's kind of the difference between them and big beers. And, and, you know, I think people can sense that, which is why they want to be a part of it. Uh, you know, and that's, again, why we started all our social media to help get that word out there. You know, again, our website, massbrewbros.com. You know, we really wanted to make sure that, you know, people could have access to all this the way we found it until they, until they can find it. And just really celebrate this whole whole idea of beer and local stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. Yes. One one last thought on that too is that another thing about it that's really cool is that in some of these smaller breweries, you go in to taste a beer or to see what they have to to offer, and it's the brewer or the assistant brewer right there behind the little tap room area who's quite possibly serving you the beer and can tell you. You know, yeah, this beer is made this way with this ingredient and that ingredient. And, I mean, that's pretty this is why cool. I made it. <laughs> yeah, be able to talk to the person who made the product you're going to buy. I mean, oh, that's, yeah. that's a pretty cool thing. People people are digging that these days. Oh, yeah, they love it. Yeah, it's great. I love being behind the bar and talking to people and, and converting people, too. Like, ah, I don't like craft beer. I'm like, try this. You know, and sure. they try it and they're like, oh, this is good. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it is good. <laughs> Have a pint, you know. <laughs> but uh yeah so i i just wanted to uh wrap it up and, and say thank you for coming on uh, uh craft beer storm i'm trying to spread the uh the movement of craft beer across the uh planet i'm, I'm, I'm going for the planet you know we'll see what happens uh, but, we're, we're just thinking with massachusetts you can have the planet. we're gonna have the planet but massachusetts is a big part of the northeast and uh, i i appreciate what you guys are doing uh, your awesome website and your efforts on uh you know uh, educating people on beer and uh, promoting new breweries and celebrating beer in massachusetts and also the northeast and um it was a good podcast and and i appreciate you coming on and i appreciate what you do thank you very much well yeah thank you michael we uh we appreciate you guys the brewers as well so um it was awesome. great to be on the show you guys yeah. got to come Cheers. up again come up and see For us sure all right sure. We'll definitely definitely. Make an appointment. okay all right, have a take care cheers yeah, that was uh, Bob and Rob of the Mass Brew Brothers, and they uh, are doing a great job uh, promoting craft beer in the state of Massachusetts and have a good uh, uh, finger on the pulse of what's going on in Mass. And, um, you know, they, they have a great website um, at massbrewbros.com. 
Uh, they're also on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, so check them out uh, if you want some more information about uh, the beer scene in Massachusetts. And if you like this uh, podcast, if you like what you're hearing, uh, if you like what we're trying to do, uh, go on to iTunes and give us a rating. Um, you know, give us a review, subscribe, tell a friend, help us out. Uh, we're also on Stitcher. But that's the only way we're going to get this thing, um, you know, going. I don't make any money off of it. Um, I just want to promote craft beer and, and local and get get people involved uh, and connect people and uh, just celebrate uh, beer. That's, that's what I want to do. So um, if you like it, get on there and uh, give us a rating and let people know that there is an alternative to mass produced watered down beer and that's local craft beer which is delicious so until next week we'll talk to you guys take care